Hello students, this is Tulika Banerjee from Forensic Science Unit, SGDB Khalsa College, University of Delhi, presenting this module on behalf of Ritu Sharma, Assistant Professor, Sachi University of Buddhist Indic Studies, Bhopal. I am delighted to present this lecture on marriage, which is taught in BA second semester. Before we start our chapter with the introduction of marriage, let's look at the other modules we will study in this chapter. Module 1, Marriage System in India. Module 2, Forms of Marriage in India. Module 3, Divorce in India. Module 4, Marriage Legislation. Module 5, Conclusion. Dear students, marriage is perceived by sociologists as a system of roles of a man and a woman whose union has been given social sanction as husband and wife. The equilibrium of the system requires adjustment between the two partners so that the role enactment of one partner corresponds to the role expectations of the other. Let's see some of the definitions given for marriage. There is no definition which adequately covers all type of human marriage. It has given a number of definitions and explanations among which the following may be noted. Edward Westmark in his History of Marriage defines marriage as the more or less durable connection between male and female lasting beyond the mere act of propagation till after the birth of offspring. Malinowski says that marriage is a contract for the production and maintenance of children. According to Robert H. Louis, marriage is a relatively permanent bond between permissible mates. Alfred McClung Lee writes, marriage is the public joining together under socially specified regulations of a man and a woman as husband and wife. It's time now to look at the characteristics of marriage. The first characteristic is universality. Marriage is more or less a universal institution. It is found among the pre-literate as well as the literate people. It is enforced as a social rule in some of the societies. Second, relationship between man and woman. Marriage is a union of men and women. It indicates relation between one or more men to one or more women. Marriage bond is enduring. Marriage indicates a long-lasting bond between the husband and wife. Hence, it is not co-extensive with sexual life. It lasts even after the sexual satisfaction is obtained. The Hindus believe that marriage is a sacred bind between the husband and wife which even the death cannot break. Marriage requires social approval. Union between men and women becomes a marital bond only when the society gives its approval. Marriage is associated with some civil or religious ceremony. Marriage gets its social recognition through some ceremony. The ceremony may have its own customs, rites and rituals etc. It means marriage has to be concluded in a public and solemn manner. Marriage creates mutual obligation. Marriage imposes certain rights and duties on both the husband and wife. Both are required to support each other and their children. Apart from the mentioned characteristics, there are some legal perspectives of marriage. Let us have a quick look at these. Legal perspective. The right to marry is a component of right to life under Article 21 of the Constitution of India which says no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to the procedure established by law. This right has been recognized under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948. Article 16 of the same states, men and women of full age without any limitation due to race nationality or religion have the right to marry 
and to found a family. They are entitled to equal rights as to marriage, during marriage and at its dissolution. Marriage shall be entered into only with the free and full consent of the intending spouses. The family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by the society and the state. The society has prescribed certain rules for marriage, rules of marriage. No society gives absolute freedom for its members to select their life partners. Rules regarding who should marry whom always govern such selection. Endogamy and exogamy are the two main rules that condition the marital choice. We will look at these two rules briefly. First it is endogamy. It is the rule of marriage in which the life partners are to be selected within the group. It is marriage within the group and the group may be caste, class, tribe, race, village, religious group, etc. We have caste endogamy, class endogamy, sub-caste endogamy, race endogamy and tribal endogamy, etc. In caste endogamy, marriage has to take place within the caste. Brahmin has to marry a Brahmin. In subcaste endogamy, it is limited to the subcaste groups. Next is exogamy. It is a rule of marriage in which an individual has to marry outside his own group. It prohibits marrying within the group. The so-called blood relatives shall neither have marital connections nor sexual contacts among themselves. All the commonly discussed forms of marriage, namely monogamy, that is marriage of a man to a woman at a time, and polygamy, that is marriage of a man or a woman to more than one spouse, are found in India. The latter, that is polygamy, has two forms, namely polygyny, that is marriage of a man to several women at a time and polyandry that is marriage of a woman to several men at a time. First we shall take up monogamy. Among the Hindus until the passing of Hindu Marriage Act of 1955, a Hindu man was permitted to marry more than one woman at a time. Although permitted, polygyny has not been common among the Hindus. Only limited sections of the population like kings, chieftains, headmen of villages, members of the landed aristocracy actually practiced polygyny. We may say that those who had the means and the power to acquire more than one wife at a time were polygynous. The other important reasons for polygyny were the barrenness of the wife and or her prolonged sickness. Among some occupational groups like the agriculturists and the artisans, polygyny prevailed because of an economic gain involved in it, where women are self-supporting and contribute substantially to the productive activity a man can gain by having more than one wife. Concerted efforts to remove this practice were made in the 19th century by Ishwar Chand Vidyasagar, Dayanand Saraswati and others. After independence, the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955 established that monogamy for all Hindus and others who came to be governed by this act. Some of the other communities covered by this act are the Sikhs, Jains and Buddhist. Strict monogamy is prescribed in Christian and Parsi communities. The next we have is polygyny. Islam, on the other hand, has allowed polygyny. A Muslim man can have as many as four wives at a time, provided all are treated as equals. 
However, it seems that polygynous unions have been restricted to a small percentage of Muslims, namely the rich and the powerful. With regard to the tribal population, we find that the customary law of the tribals in general, except a few, has not forbidden polygyny. Polygyny is more widespread among the tribes of North and Central India. Next is polyandry. Polyandry is even less common than polygyny. A few Kerala castes practiced polyandry until recently. The Toda of the Nilgiris in Tamil Nadu, the Khasa of John Sir Bavar in Dehradun district of Uttaranchal, and some North Indian castes practice polyandry. In the fraternal form of polyandry, the husbands are brothers. In 1958, CM Abraham has reported that in central Travancore, fraternal polyandry was practiced by large number of groups like the Irava, Kanyan, the Velan and the Asari. The factors that are related to the prevalence of polyandry are desire to prevent division of property within a family, especially in fraternal polyandry, desire to preserve the unity and solidarity of the sibling group in fraternal polyandry, the need for more than one husband in a society where men are away on a commercial or military journey, a difficult economy, especially an unfertile soil which does not favour division of land and belongings as stated by Peter in the year 1968. Divorce is the legal cessation of a matrimonial bond. All the personal laws in India provide for divorce under certain grounds and conditions. Though there are different acts governing people belonging to different religions, the grounds provided for divorce are more or less the same with minor variations though. Divorce provisions and grounds under the laws are Hindu Law Section 13 of the Hindu Marriage Act 1955 which provides for divorce is any marriage solemnized whether before or after the commencement of this act may on a petition presented by either the husband or the wife be dissolved by a decree of divorce on the ground that the other party has after the solemnization of the marriage had voluntary sexual intercourse with any person other than his or her spouse has after the solemnization of marriage treated the petitioner with cruelty or has deserted the petitioner for a continuous period of not less than two years immediately preceding the presentation of the petition has ceased to be a Hindu by conversion of or to another religion has been incurably of unsound mind or has been suffering continuously or intermittently from mental disorder of such a kind and to such an extent that the petitioner cannot be reasonably expected to live with the respondent has been suffering from a virulent and incurable form of leprosy, has been suffering from venereal disease in a communicable form, has renounced the world by entering any religious order, has not been heard of as being alive for a period of seven years or more by those persons who would naturally have heard of it had that party been alive. Either party to a marriage, whether solemnized before or after the commencement of this act, may also present a petition for the dissolution of the marriage by a decree of divorce on the ground 
there has been no resumption of cohabitation as between the parties to the marriage for a period of one year or upwards after the passing of a decree for judicial separation in a proceeding to which they were parties or that there has been no restitution of conjugal rights in a proceeding to which they were parties. A wife may also present a petition for the dissolution of her marriage by a decree of divorce on the ground in the case of any marriage solemnized before the commencement of this act that the husband had married again before such commencement or that any other wife of the husband married before such commencement was alive at the time of the solemnization of the marriage of the petitioner provided that in either case the other wife is alive at the time of the presentation of the petition that the husband has since the solemnization of the marriage been guilty of rape, sodomy or bestiality or that in a suit under section 18 of the Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act of 1956, 78 of 1956 or in a proceeding under section 125 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973, 2 of 1974 or under the corresponding section 488 of the Code of Criminal Procedure Code 1898, 5 of 1898, a decree or order as the case may be has been passed against the husband awarding maintenance to the wife notwithstanding that she was living apart and that since the passing of such decree or order cohabitation between the parties has not been resumed for one year or upwards that her marriage whether consummated or not was solemnized before she attained the age of 15 years and she has repudiated the marriage after attaining that age but before the age of 18 years. A Special Marriage Act of 1954 The divorce provision under the Special Marriage Act of 1954 is contained in section 27 which is as follows 1. Subject to the provisions of this Act and to the rules made there under a petition for divorce may be presented to the district court either by the husband or the wife on the ground that the respondent has after the solemnization of the marriage had voluntary sexual intercourse with any person other than his or her spouse has deserted the petitioner for a continuous period of not less than two years immediately preceding the presentation of the petition is undergoing a sentence of imprisonment for seven years or more for an offence as defined in the Indian Penal Code 45 of 1860. Has since the solemnization of the marriage treated the petitioner with cruelty or has been incurably of unsound mind or has been suffering continuously or intermittently from mental disorder of such a kind and to such an extent that the petitioner cannot reasonably be expected to live with the respondent has been suffering from venereal disease in a communicable form or has been suffering from leprosy the disease not having been contracted from the petitioner or has not been heard of as being alive for a period of seven years or more by those persons who would naturally have heard of the respondent 
if the respondent had been alive. 1a. A wife may also present a petition for divorce to the district on the ground that her husband has, since the solemnization of the marriage, been guilty of rape, sodomy and bestiality. That in a suit under section 18 of the Hindu Adoptions and Maintenance Act 1956, 78 of 1956 or in a proceeding under section 125 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973, 2 of 1974 or under the corresponding section 488 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1898, 5 of 1898, a decree or order as the case may be has been passed against the husband awarding maintenance to the wife notwithstanding that she was living apart and that since passing of such decree or order, cohabitation between the parties has not been resumed for one year or upwards. Subject to the provisions of this act and to the rules thereunder, either party to a marriage, whether solemnized before or after the commencement of the Special Marriage Amendment Act 1970, 29 of 1970, may present a petition for divorce to the district court on the ground that there has been no resumption of cohabitation as between the parties to the marriage for a period of one year or upwards after the passing of a decree for judicial suppression in a proceeding to which they were parties or that there has been no restitution of conjugal rights as between the parties to the marriage for a period of one year or upwards after the passing of a decree for restitution of conjugal rights in a proceeding to which they were parties. Although it may be said that divorce has helped the women to develop the feeling of independence in them and make them feel equal partner, yet it may not be advocated that divorce should not be easily granted by the courts. It cannot be denied that divorce causes instability of family in view of its serious repercussions on family life. Divorce should not be within easy reach of the partners. Efforts should be made to bring reunion between husband and wife. Divorce should be granted only when it has become unavoidable and is in the interest of both the husband and wife and the society at large. The marriage system had undergone radical changes especially after independence. Even though the basic religious beliefs associated with marriage have not crumbled down, many of the practices, customs and forms have changed. The recent changes in the marriage systems have been discussed here. The laws enacted in India relate to age at marriage, field of mate selection, number of spouses in marriage, dissolving marriage, dowry and remarriage. The important legislations relating to these aspects are the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929 amended in 1978 dealing with age at marriage, the Special Marriage Act of 1954 dealing with age at marriage, freedom to children to marry without parental consent, bigamy and dissolving marriage, the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955 amended in 1986 and dealing with age at marriage with parents consent, bigamy and annulment of marriage, Anti-Dowry Act of 1961 and the Widow Remarriage Act of 1856.
the first three acts of 1929, 1954 and 1955 pertaining to the age of marriage prescribes the marriage age of girls as 18 years and for boys as 21 years. The difference in the acts is that the 1929 act amended in 1978 does not invalidate the marriage for violating the provisions in the act. It only prescribes punishment for the bridegroom, parents, guardians and the priest but not for women. The 1955 act makes invalidation of the marriage possible for violation of the age provision. This 1955 act covers marriages performed with the consent of parents but the 1954 act covers marriages performed through courts with or without the parental consent. Both these acts that is of 1954 and 1955 prohibit bigamy and permit divorce also on various grounds and put restrictions on marriage within the degrees of prohibited relationships unless custom permits such marriages. The Anti-Dowry Act of 1961 has made giving and taking dowry as a legal offence. The Widow Remarriage Act of 1856 permits widows to remarry but forfeits them the right of maintenance from the property of the first husband. The Hindu Succession Act of 1956 has given share to wife and daughters in man's property equal to that of sons and brothers. Though these new trends are observed today, the importance of marriage has not diminished. It is still universally practiced. Though its sanctity is affected a little, it is not reduced to the level of a mere civil contract in Indian society. Students, now you all are familiar with the recent changes in the marriage system in India. We have learned that marriage is considered to be an institution in India. It is a sanskar or purifactory ceremony, obligatory for every Hindu. The Hindu religious books have joined marriage as a duty because an unmarried man cannot perform some of the most important religious ceremonies. There are various types of marriages that are followed in our country, monogamy being followed at large. As the society has advanced, the Hindu marriage has gone through various changes. Even values attached to it have changed tremendously. Individuals now are selecting their mates according to their own requirements. Many are not getting into matrimonial alliances due to some problems. The marriages in India are governed by Hindu Marriage Act and Special Marriage Act which regulates the marriage. The provision of divorce has also helped many people to come out of their marriage. Thus, as believed, Hindu marriage is no more indissoluble. With this, our module as well as this chapter on marriage comes to an end. I am sure you all have understood the central idea behind this module. Do keep in mind what we discussed today. I will be back with one more lecture in this series. If you want to learn more and enhance your knowledge, you may log on to our website www.cec.nic.in for MCQ, quizzes, LORs, etc. Make sure you revise the modules frequently so that you master the topic well and take up the exercises. I will see you in the next lecture. Keep learning. Work hard and do revise the chapter. Goodbye.